Welcome back everyone to another video in the Retro Breakdown series where today we're going to talk about the Nintendo 3DS. Highly requested by my viewers as well as the first handheld that we are covering in this series. And the reasons why I'm starting with this one is because it was quite an innovating handheld for its time, but what's really under the hood that powered its unique graphics. Today we're diving deep into the hardware specifications, focusing on the GPU as well as overall system architecture, and then we'll also have some fun and compare it to its predecessor and put it all together. But before we begin, if you're new to the channel, consider subscribing if you enjoy tech videos or watch my next videos in this Retro Breakdown series where I'm planning on going over all of the consoles that have ever released and their GPUs and other various hardware such as CPUs. And if you enjoy this video at all, make sure to smack the like button. That way YouTube will actually share this video to other people who may enjoy it as well. As always, I really appreciate your support. So let's just get right into it. The 3DS used the DMP Pika 200, developed by Digital Media Professionals. It runs at a 268 MHz clock speed and is optimized for low power consumption while delivering stereoscopic 3D rendering. The Pika 200 has four pixel pipelines, each capable of processing one pixel per clock cycle, and has four texture units as well. Overall, the GPU can handle up to 15.3 million polygons per second with a fill rate of 900 million pixels per second. Unlike modern GPUs that use fully programmable shaders, where developers can write custom code to create complex lighting, shadows, and post-processing effects, the 3DS's Pika 200 GPU relies on a fixed function pipeline. This means it uses a set of predefined hardwired operations for rendering instead of custom shader programs. While that does limit its creative flexibility, it also makes the GPU incredibly efficient and low power which is obviously ideal for a portable system. At the heart of the Pika 200 is what DMP called the Maestro Graphics Pipeline, a configurable series of hardware stages responsible for handling tasks like vertex transformation, texture blending, lighting, and pixel output. Despite its fixed function nature, the Maestro Pipeline supported advanced features like procedural textures, per pixel lighting, and environment mapping. Developers use mathematically generated textures to simulate shading gradients or surface details without using up memory, and per pixel lighting was handled through built-in lighting stages that mimicked effects like specular highlights and fong shading. Environment mapping for reflective surfaces was achieved using texture lookups based on surface normals and camera angle. While the pipeline wasn't programmable, it was flexible enough to allow developers to obviously creatively combine techniques like scrolling textures for animated water, multi-pass rendering for glow effects, and projected shadows to push impressive visuals out of the 3DS hardware. And thanks to its stereoscopic 3D capabilities, the Pika 200 can render two separate images for each eye, creating the signature 3D effect. However, this comes at a cost. Rendering two frames simultaneously cuts the effective fill rate in half from 800 megapixels per second down to 400. Now, as always with every GPU video, we have to discuss the memory of the 3DS, which includes 128 megabytes of fast cycle RAM, otherwise known as FC RAM, developed by Fujitsu. I probably butchered that. This RAM operates at 3.2 gigabytes a second peak bandwidth shared between the CPU and the GPU. Approximately 32 megabytes is reserved for the operating system, including background services like Wi-Fi connectivity, notifications, and the multitasking features the 3DS supported. So that leaves around 96 megabytes available for games, of which 6 megabytes are essentially carved out of that and dedicated as first acting VRAM, with the rest of the memory used between the CPU and the GPU as needed. And even at 96 megabytes, we're looking at a massive increase from Nintendo's last handheld, the Nintendo DS, which just had 4 megabytes total, and the 3DS has even more RAM dedicated for games than its home console at the time of its launch, the Nintendo Wii. Despite this increase in RAM, developers still had to rely on aggressive compression techniques at the time as well, such as lower resolution textures and efficient asset streaming to work with what was available, especially later in its life cycle. To further maximize performance on the 3DS's hardware, developers used a variety of clever techniques to work around memory and processing constraints. One common strategy was preloading textures into the 6 megabytes of memory allocated for VRAM ahead of time. This minimized loading times during gameplay and avoided constant memory transfers, which could slow things down. Geometry was also heavily optimized. Instead of using high polygon models, developers designed characters and environments with minimal vertex counts and reused assets wherever possible to save memory. 
On top of that, many studios took advantage of the Pika 200 GPU's ability to generate graphics procedurally. This meant creating patterns, shading effects, or surface details through math rather than storing them as large image files, which then reduced texture size and RAM usage. These techniques allowed games to maintain smoother frame rates and better visual fidelity within the system's tight constraint. Despite the 3DS's modest specs, developers who understood the hardware well were definitely able to squeeze out surprisingly impressive visuals for the little machine. And although a large step back in performance compared to a its competitor at the time, the PlayStation Vita, the Nintendo 3DS was a massive increase over its predecessor, the Nintendo DS. The leap in graphical capability and memory is more massive than I think a lot of people are aware of, even if the 3DS was still carefully balanced around power and cost constraints while utilizing this new 3D technology. To give you an idea, the original DS used a relatively basic 2D plus 3D GPU setup based on fixed function hardware with extremely limited capabilities. It could render around 120,000 textured polygons per second, and its lighting system was minimal, primarily vertex lighting with simple shading and no support for effects like per pixel lighting or reflections, of course. Most games relied heavily on 2D sprites utilized by that 2D GPU or very simple 3D geometry by the 3D GPU. Finally, it had 4 megabytes of RAM that had a 0.6 gigabytes a second bandwidth. In contrast, the 3DS introduced a far more advanced graphics processor. The Digital Media Professional's Pika 200 ran at 268 MHz. Now, the hardware configuration in the DS is a little harder to compare just clock speeds here because they don't have a flat-out graphics processor in the same way that I could compare with the 3DS as far as clock speeds go, and I will cover that in a later video. But the architectural change and the clock speed on its own was a massive jump in graphics performance. And even though this GPU still used a fixed function pipeline, its featured Maestro graphics architecture would support for the aforementioned per pixel lighting, procedural textures generated in hardware, environment mapping, multi-texture support and programmable blending operations, as well as just the capability of up to 15.3 million polygons per second compared to the DS's 120,000 textured polygons per second. Not only is the new GPU vastly more powerful, it also has hardware features not possible in its predecessor. And with that same fixed function pipeline, those hardware features allowed developers to take higher resolution and higher detailed graphics and add complex effects like water distortion, glowing objects, and even reflections all within the limits of the Maestro pipeline. So overall, again, despite being technically inferior to its competition at the time, the 3DS still thrived thanks to its unique 3D effect, its strong game library, and Nintendo's TLC. It once again proved that raw power isn't everything for Nintendo. Smart hardware design and software ingenuity can create a lasting gaming experience. And with that said, I really don't have anything else left to say in this video, but what are your thoughts on the 3DS hardware? Do you have any stories with this console you'd like to share? Let me know down below in the comments. You really are a real one and I consider you a top supporter, so definitely please shout out down in the comments so I can engage with you further there. Anyway, I wish you guys all a great morning, afternoon, evening, or night, and I will catch you in my next video. Peace.